ultrasound identifies the bone malformations in the children. Now there's a way around this. So what we're trying to do is looking at these children who have this cleft palate missing, if you look at them from inside, you can see they have some hard tissue and soft tissue missing. And what will happen to this child is they will produce teeth right around here, but they won't produce teeth here, even if you fill it up with a piece of hip bone or leg bone or whatever, and, and close in the gap with uh, plastic surgery. So what we're trying to do is something different, to use the child's own stem cells to help them. This requires a slightly different type of stem cell. So once we've taken the cord blood out of the cord and it goes to the clinic, we can take the Wharton's jelly from the cord and we can produce the mesenchymal stem cells. And these are perfect for making bone and cartilage. This is what a piece of umbilical cord looks like when you've taken most of the blood out of it. You can still see this jelly bit here. You can see the major veins and arteries going through it. But this Wharton's jelly is rich in a very special type of stem cell. And you can take little pieces of this and you can grow it inside the laboratory and they grow it into this very, very strange stream type of stem cell. When you first take a little blob of it, it looks like this, it starts to grow out of the blob, then it grows even more, and it continues to grow, and it grows in a very reproducible way. And then you can work out how much you need to produce to use for a particular child. This is what these stringy stem cells look like up close. They're a bit more interesting than corpulent stem cells, which I still think are a little bit more boring compared to this, but you know, it's just a preference. <laughs> and what we can do is we can take them and we can grow them at a particular speed and grow them and grow them and grow them until we have enough stem cells to be able to produce bone and cartilage in this procedure. So the idea is, if you look from below here, you've got the complete missing cleft here, or a bilateral cleft on a child here. We model the area into which you need to produce stem cells and how much you need to produce, either cartilage, uh, semi-hard tissue, or bone hard tissue. And then we are able to take that mold out, and then we take our stem cells, which we had made previously, and we put them into our mold, and then we're able to put them back in again into the child. And so the overall idea here is to be able to take the child's own stem cells, 100% tissue typed to that child, into bone, which will stay with that child for the rest of the child's life. And this is the overall plan. This is a work in progress and um, we think it's extremely important because an awful lot of people in the developing world don't have access to ultrasound or modern imaging techniques and so these children are born and even then sometimes in some of the third world these children get left to die so we have to do everything we can to try to help them. But you can see that you know a child can go on to live a very healthy life with a cleft palate. Another tissue that we've had a, a lot of success in developing is nervous tissues. And um, this has been one of the big areas that people have been hoping for because of brain-related illness or spinal cord damage after car accidents and so on. And we believed that it was important that we worked on this. And in fact, I have to tell you that growing nervous tissues in the laboratory is one of the easiest things we've been able to do so far, surprisingly. What we do is we take small bioreactors made with our friends in NASA, which allows us to keep the stem cells moving in one area. Because you have to remember, as you sit here, you're not sitting flat in a laboratory like a group of embryonic stem cells. You're growing in a three-dimensional human body. And so if you want to put something into you, you want to grow them in three dimensions. So what you can see here is a group of nervous tissues growing in three dimensions, and then we can take it out. And you can see here a group of these nervous tissues growing. And we can use these to model what happens in stroke. We can use these to model what happens in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And we can use these to test drugs on. Now this is extremely important because we want to be able to develop much better drugs for brain-related illness. And I don't personally believe that we're going to be injecting stem cells into people's brains for a very long time. But what we can do 
is take these groups of cells that were made in the laboratory and test drugs on them to make better drugs for you and for me and for other people. And when we look at this, uh, the cells in purple are human brain cells, which were taken from a patient undergoing stroke uh, therapy. And the green ones we have taken from human umbilical cord blood, and we've labeled them green. And you can see here, the green ones from cord blood stem cells are communicating all over the place towards the ones which are purple from the human brain. So what we're trying to understand is, in patients with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, why do these things stop connecting? Why do people lose the connections in their brain, which leads to this illness, and how can we get them to go back again? And it's not easy, but I believe it's one of the most important things we can do for older patients. And again, we don't expect people to believe us that we can do this, so we give these tissues to independent neurology specialists, and they do their tests, and they tell us that they're active, and they do these tests. This is from an independent group who took our cells, there they are. And they put them into their machine and they made sure that they were active. And you can see, well, they look pretty active to me. <laughs> and here, up close and personal, you can see the connections going between two of these cells. And this, these connections are the connections that break down in old age in these particular brain-related illnesses that we're trying to stop and we're trying to get them to go back again. Why is this important? Well, it's not just important for the older population as we get older, it's also important for children. And so one of the big reasons I moved to France was because I wanted to push forward these treatments into the clinic. And now we have a new clinical trial which we're developing for children with something called cerebral palsy. Now, one in 200 children will be starved of oxygen at birth. Now, don't panic because most of these children will go on to be perfectly normal. But sometimes during the normal birthing process, a child will be starved of oxygen. Sometimes, however, the starving of oxygen will be so bad that they will get hypoxia or asphyxia and they will go on to have cerebral palsy, they will have brain-related illness or they will have problems uh, with movement and so on. And I believe that we can help these children. So what we've started to do is to develop a brand new treatment, fully authorised by the French government in 2010, where we have three patient groups. One will get standard uh, body cooling, which is what they get right now, to try to in reduce the inflammation and the heat on the brain, which leads to scars on the brain later and problems later. And these group, the second group will get one injection of these stem cells close to birth within 36 hours, again to reduce the inflammation and to reduce the damage on the brain. And we'll be using a type of stem cell that we've developed which is very, very good at cleaning up damage and removing debris, which is very important for reducing the damage that was produced in the brain during that few seconds, that few minutes or whatever that caused the problem during the birth. And then the third group will have two injections, one immediately after birth and then one uh, anything between three weeks and three months later to see whether we can stimulate the brain and re-stimulate the brain after the debris has been cleared up. Now this is not science fiction because a similar clinical trial is also underway in America, and our friends in Asia are also developing this. And while we do not believe that we will cure every single child with cerebral palsy, we do believe that we will be able to increase the degree of their cognitive brain functions and their motor functions and their muscles and make their lives better. Now, I was very moved when I was in California two years ago and I met a family where the mother said, before the injection, the child, when she took the child in the pram out into the park, the child couldn't hold her head up to look around the trees. After the uh, therapy, the child wasn't that much better in some ways, but could hold her own head up and could look around. Now, who is to say that that wasn't worth doing? To give that child a, more, a better quality of life, to be able to hold its own head up, rather than always having to have the mother hold its head up. I mean, it's, some people actually speak out against such therapy, saying that the degree of therapy is just isn't good enough. I believe that we should always try to improve the quality of life of a disabled child, and we should never leave any stone unturned until we can. from across Europe, and we've asked the European Parliament for 6 million euros to try to take it forward, but I don't know if we're going to test it We hope that they will. So, in summary, 
adult stem cells work? It is not controversial, and life is not destroyed to do it. So I thoroughly encourage you to go out there and tell your friends, families, doctors, ministers of health, T-shirts, and other people that stem cells should be allowed in Ireland, and adult stem cells is the right way to go.